y'all would, let's stand and let's sing together and let's worship our Lord for who he is and what he does. Good morning, church. How are you this morning? All right. Y'all have a seat. I have a special guest up here with me this morning. Uh, if y'all don't know him, his name is Mr. Will King. That's right. Will, Will is our solo graduate this year. Um, he's the only one we had that came up and put up a table for Graduate Sunday. And so that means this day is all his now, right? 
And so if you have not had a chance to go out there and see Will's tables, he didn't just, you, you, <laughs> did you notice, Will, you didn't just get a table, you got tables. That's what happens when your mama's in charge. Do you realize that? Yeah, yeah. When mamas, when you let mamas get in charge of something, their kids don't just get like tables. Table. They get tables. Like, yeah. Everything's bigger in Texas. Everything's bigger in Texas, <laughs> including multiple tables. That's right. But so, hey, we are we are excited because Will is graduating high school, um, and I guess he graduates. When is your graduation? Exactly the day. Friday. Friday. Yes, sir. Okay. And so, tell us what you're going to do after graduation. Uh, probably be an electrician or a welder. One of Okay, electrician or welder, definitely, definitely needed uh, today. Um, that's one of the things that if you, have, if you have not noticed, one of the things that we desperately need uh, are what we would co- consider blue-collar workers, electricians, plumbers. We need these guys. People, too many people are wanting to sit in the air conditioning in the shade, right? Uh, but that's not Will because I promise you, if he's behind a welder, uh, he's not afraid of getting hot or burned. Have you ever gotten burned? Oh, and he's got scars to prove it. See there? <laughs> Praise God for that. Well, Will, I want to share something with you this morning. Just a little word of advice as you sort of go out into the world. Um, one of my favorite scriptures is in Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. It tells us, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. In that scripture, there's some commands. The first command is to trust. So the greatest thing that you can do is you can trust the Lord. The world will tell you to trust your heart. Never trust your heart because the Bible tells us that your heart is deceitful among all things. Who we trust is the Lord. And the Lord gives you his spirit and the Lord gives you his word to guide you and direct you. And so he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Um, That's the one thing I have to remind myself of is, uh, you know, Pastor Craig wants things to sometimes always make sense. Um, And when the Lord's at work, a lot of times things don't make sense. And and so we lean on him for everything. We trust him and we lean in. And so the scripture says, lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. We trust, we lean, we acknowledge. We acknowledge that he is holy, that, that he is sovereign that he is good, that he is just. We acknowledge that everything that we need in this life and for eternal life, he has provided and we trust him. And so that's the best advice I could give anyone um, as they're moving forward in life. And so the last thing I wanna do for you is I wanna pray for you. So we're gonna step down here, Will. Go ahead and step down there. And if you are here, I want you all to stand. And this is how we open in prayer. If you're here, though, some of our deacons, some of our, our elders, if y'all want to come up here, just like we did last week at the baby dedication, y'all just want to lay your hands as we pray on will. Y'all come on up here. Don't be afraid to do it. If you want to be a part of this, you come on. We are, we are, this is, this is sort of a sending out process, Right? Um, that's what the church is supposed to do is we send people out and as, as Will is hitting a big accomplishment in his life we're sending him out and asking the Lord's favor upon him and so uh, church just pray with me All right, Heavenly Father God we come to you Lord we come to you knowing that you are sovereign, that you are good that you are just and that you brought Will to this very point in his life Will stands here today and he breathes because of you. Will is in this church today and and, and stands here in this building because you brought him here. He has the parents that you have given him. Um, Lord, everything that he has, uh, you have given him. And Lord, we acknowledge your sovereignty over his life. And Lord, as he takes a step out, as he leaves high school and he steps sort of out into the world, um, Lord, we are asking you to make your presence known to guide every step of his path. Lord, we pray that he will trust you, that he will lean into you, and that he will acknowledge you for who you are. And Lord, in that, Lord, he will serve you. No matter where he goes, whether he's a welder or an electrician or whatever he does in life, 
Lord, may he serve you. And whatever he does, may he do it well for your honor and for your glory. Lord, we ask that you continue to bless his life. May your favor be upon him. May your face shine upon him. And we ask this in the holy, wonderful, glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Will. Y'all give Will a round of applause. different issues, depression, the enemy, darkness, but I'm here to say there's no name like the name of Jesus. He can conquer over fears and doubts, depression, and all, everything you're going through, Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Until every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope. And there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Oh, because your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadow. Burn light.
Jesus over every heart and every mind cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Come on church, sing it out with me, shout it. Shout Jesus in my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me as he is wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree his body and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone the side of sin and blood oh, praise the of the Lord. 
The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the sin. My gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. we love you and we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come and worship you for who you are and what you do. God, we love you and we thank you. God, I just want to pray for Pastor Craig as he's about to deliver this message. God, I pray that it's not his words and that it's yours and that it's your Holy Spirit speaking through him. God, we love you and we thank you. In your holy and precious name I pray. And everybody says, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Um, we uh, Today, I'm going to offer you, uh, as we prepare for communion, a, a buffet of scriptures, you might say. Uh, I am uh, uh, an expository preacher. And if that's a new word to you and you say, I don't know what an expository preacher is, um, that is a, a, a preacher that likes to take one single text and preach through the text, teaching through the text. And I may have support scriptures for it, um, but I preach one specific text uh, explaining the context of it. Um, And so that's normally how I like to preach. Um, Some other people, um, they don't like to preach that way, and that doesn't mean that my way or their way is any better. That's just how we like to do it. And, And so today I'm going more topical than you might say. And so when I say I have a buffet... Uh, of scriptures as we prepare ourselves today uh, for the Lord's table. I have a buffet of scriptures for you. That means we're going to be all over God's word looking at specific scriptures together. Uh, But we're going to start with one, all right? One scripture to focus us uh, on the point. 
Focus us on the, the reason that we're going through this buffet of scriptures. Um, and we're going to look at Luke chapter 22. So if you would stand with me um, as you grab your copy uh, of God's word and, and you open it up to Luke chapter um, 22, we're going to read God's word um, together. And what we're going to find here um, is we're going to find the disciples uh, at, the, at the table with Jesus at the, at the Lord's Supper. I'm going to start uh, in verse 14, if you would follow with me. When the hour had come, it says in Luke uh, 22, 14, he reclined at the table uh, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup, he had given thanks, and he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread, he had given thanks And he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful today to be invited to your table. Lord, as the scripture said, you earnestly desired um, that day to eat that Passover with with your apostles. And I believe you earnestly desire to see this Uh, communion take place today in your church. Lord, we come before your table and we come before humbly, Lord, undeserving to be able to come before your table, before your throne. But Lord, I pray that as we look deep into your scriptures, as we remember who you are, what you've done, Lord, I pray that as we remember, Lord, that our hearts will be tender and pliable to what your scriptures teach us today. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity, and in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So what we see there in verse 19, it says, and then he took some bread, and as he took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, he gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He's telling his disciples as they move forward without him, remember now, they're They're getting ready. He's getting ready to walk out, be betrayed. Um, Judas is going to sell him, you know, for for just a little bit of silver, is going to sell him over to the religious leaders of that day. They are going to... Uh, They are going to beat him, abuse him, humiliate him, and hang him on a cross for the sins of man. They didn't realize that's what they were doing, but prophecy is fulfilling itself right in front of them, including right here. And so what we see in the midst of this, right, is Jesus says, I need you to remember. Remember these moments. Remember what takes place. Remember why I did this. And so today as we come together as a church, we come together before the table, and that's the same instruction that is given to us is, is remember. Remember who he is. Remember what he's done. Remember his promises. And so today, that's what we want to do. We want to just take a look this morning as we prepare our hearts. This is a heart preparation time for you and for me. And as we come to the table to take communion together, there are three things I want us to remember and to reflect on. And the very first thing, if you're taking notes and you have your notes there, the very first thing that I believe we should focus on, the very first thing that I believe we should look at and understand and remember, we need to remember the holiness of Christ. The holiness of Christ. In 1 Peter, if you have your copy of 1 Peter, go ahead and turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1. It's also right there in your notes. 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter here writing to the church in verse 13 says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. In 1 Peter chapter 1, he's telling the church, he's telling believers. I want you to understand, he's writing to believers this morning. He's saying, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit and fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
And in verse 14, he says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust, which were yours in your ignorance. Now, what he's telling the church there is, he's saying, listen, now that you know Christ, now that he is your Lord and your Savior, now that you have been saved by the blood, your heart's been transformed, you need to be obedient you, you, need to, you need to prepare your minds for action. You need to keep sober in spirit. You need to fix your own completely on the grace that God brought to you through the revelation of Jesus and his obedient children. Don't be conformed to the former ways of life that you lived before you were a Christian because you lived them in ignorance. You lived them in ignorance. That's one of the reasons the scriptures tell us that we don't judge the world. The world has a judge. Jesus is their judge. We don't judge them. We are, we are not judgmental toward the way that the world lives because they live in ignorance. They live in ignorance to who God is. They live in ignorance to who Jesus is. They live in ignorance to the work of the Holy Spirit. They, 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 they do these things in ignorance, unaware they're doing it unaware that, of, that they even need salvation. But those of us that have been enlightened, those of us that are considered saved, those of us that truly know Jesus and Jesus knows us, for us, we don't live as we are ignorant any longer. Like we have been enlightened through the revelation of Jesus Christ that we live this life according to the way he has taught us. We follow Jesus. That's why we're called Jesus followers. That's why in Antioch they called them, it was in Antioch the book of Acts tells us that they were, we were first called Christians. And it was really a derogatory comment. But it's like we're little mini Jesuses following, doing everything that he does. We follow him. And so we, the scripture tells us, don't be conformed to the, the former lust of which you, know, you were ignorant to. But in verse 15, it says, but like the Holy One. All right, the, the, the first thing I want you to remember, and if you didn't know this, I don't, you don't need to remember it. You need to etch it now into your memory. All right, Jesus is holy. God is holy. And But like the Holy One, talking about Christ, who called you, the one that called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, the one that called you to salvation that he freely gives, the one that died on the cross for your sins and called you out of those sins, he's the one that called you, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves. That's what we are called to. My friend, today, if you are here and you are truly a follower of Jesus Christ, the call on your life is to be holy. Don't, you know, what we like to do, we like to take Scripture many times out of context and we like to manipulate it. And we like to use Scriptures like, well, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. That is true. But that Scripture, you as a believer, that Scripture does not give you permission to go on sinning to go on living your life as you're ignorant to what the gospel is. The Bible says that you are called to be holy. You are called to be holy, just like the Holy One that called you. Be holy yourselves in all your behavior, not just some of your behavior, not just when people are watching, not, not just when you're at church, but every time Every moment, every second of your life, you live your life to be holy in all of your behavior because it is written, you shall be holy, he says, for I am holy. We are made holy and righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ. We have the ability. Let me tell you something. We have the ability to live holy lives. Christ gives us that power. Now, we may not yield to that power. That's the problem Pastor Craig has. Pastor Craig allows the flesh sometimes to take over. And the flesh is what makes 
anger rise up in me and me react in ways that I shouldn't act. It's my flesh, right, that causes me to lust after things, you know, lust of things of the world. It's the flesh that causes greed. It's the flesh that causes this, the, you know, jealousy. It's the flesh that causes those things, but Christ has given me power over that flesh. Christ has given me his spirit to overcome those things. Christ has given me his spirit to convict me of those things, that when those things happen in my life and I see where I'm falling short, I don't make an excuse and say, well, you know, it's just another day and I'm a sinner and I fall short of the glory of God. No, that's not good enough. Christ died for me, gave his life for me, and he has called me to live a holy life. Here's one of the problems. When we think about holiness, we think about perfection, right? That is, that's usually when you ask uh, the, an, a, the average, even churchgoer, Christian, like, what do you, what, how do you, what do you think, what do you call holy? What is holy? And we think of like perfection and sinless. That's holy, right? That's not how holy is defined. If you go back even to the Hebrew, the word is kadesh. And that word does not mean like sinless and perfect, even though perfection is a part of it. But the actual word defined means to be set apart. So begin to grasp this in your mind, okay? When we are called holy, we are to be set apart from the world that we were saved out of. We are to be set apart from the sin that once ensnared us. We are, our lives are to be set apart. We are to be separate from those things. For you to be holy is for you to follow Jesus, for you to do your best to live like Jesus, and that the world looks at you and says, man, they are different. You should not be offended if somebody calls you a holy roller. Because what they just called you is holy. And that's what you are called to be. Holy. Set apart. God is holy. So when we think about God, he is set apart from the sin of this world. He is set apart from all the ungodliness. He is set apart from those things. He is holy. He is pure. He is blameless. He is perfection. When you think of holy, God is completely set apart from everything. He is the supreme being. There, there's no other created being that is ahead of him. He is holy and separate in all of who he is, in his perfection. He is holy. He is separated. He, he is completely different. There is no sin. In his love, his love is holy. His no, love is not like ours. I talked about love last week in 1 John chapter 4. We, we looked at that last week and we, God is love, right? That's what we learned. Beloved, let us love one another. For those that love God know God. For God is love. But his love, it is separate than the world's love. It is separated because the world's love is selfish and self-driven. But God's love, it is a perfect love that is set apart from the way that love exists in this world. Everything about him, his holiness is represented. And he is the most supreme, the most spectacular, the most powerful, the most beautiful, the most amazing, the most loving. That is him. He is completely set apart in everything and in everything he is perfect. One of the greatest examples that we have in scripture, turn in your Bibles to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6. In your notes there, you have lines. If you want to write Isaiah chapter 6, write that down so you can go back and, and you can reference it. But in, in, when we talk about holiness, the Isaiah gives us this picture. And I want you to understand and I want you to look at this picture. 
that Isaiah gives us. And he says this in verse 1. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne. There's a beautiful song. Uh, I can't think of the name of it right now. Um, And a portion of this song comes from this text. All right, it comes from this text, this vision that Isaiah has. And in Isaiah 6, 1, it says, And in the year of the King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted with the train of his robe, filling the temple. I want you to understand why that's important. Because in this day and age, kings were sort of judged by the train of their robe. If you had a long, beautiful, majestic train, it sort of signified power and majesty. And what what is revealed to Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, it says, Then the train of his robe filled the temple. Like it was greater than any other robe that has ever existed. The robe filled the temple. There's not a king that could wear the robe because of the heaviness and the weight of the robe. They couldn't move. But the Lord's robe filled the temple in all of its glory. And the seraphim, the seraphim, which would be mighty angels and guards. And the word seraphim comes from flames, like burning The seraphim would be like burning, like angels on fire, right? That's what they would look like. And the the seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two, he covered his face. And with two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And he had, what he's saying is the seraphim had their face covered and they had their feet covered and they flew with the other two wings. And the seraphim that had this burning desire only to serve and love the Lord are just like sitting there hovering, hovering in this place of worship, just waiting, right? Just waiting for instructions. Like, tell me where to go. Tell me where to, to, what to do. Tell me who to help. Tell me who to guard. Tell me what you want. Because I am here to serve you. And you have this picture of these angelic fire beings before his throne. And then Isaiah goes on to say in verse 3, And one called out to another. One called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The importance of the three holies. It would be almost like in English we would say, like if we were talking about that somebody is loving, we would say, oh, they're not just loving, but they are more than just loving. In fact, they are the most loving, like there is no one else above them. No one else can love like they love. It is the maximum. It is the completeness. He is not just holy and set apart, but he is holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He he is set apart to the point of complete perfection, the complete God, the importance of this is there is no other God like him. There is no other God ahead of him. He is holy, 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 and set apart. And the whole earth, it says, is filled with his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out. And while the temple was filled with smoke, then I said. So I want you to just stop there at verse 5. And I want you to imagine Isaiah. He is seeing all this in this vision. He is, he, he is, he is feeling smaller and smaller and smaller and weaker and weaker and weaker and more sinful and more sinful. And this is the prophet Isaiah. And he's realizing, I should, he's thinking in his mind, I should not be here. 
I don't deserve to be here. Uh, uh, in fact, a fear of who God is is resting upon him in this moment. And in verse 5, you see it, and he said, And woe for me, for I am ruined. Woe, woe for me, for I am ruined. Like, I shouldn't even be breathing. I should not be alive. I should be dead before this mighty, holy, holy, holy God. And, 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 and woe to me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He, he, he understood in that moment his frailty, his sinfulness. He does not deserve to be in God's presence. And he says, woe is me as I am ruined. What we, the reason we have to understand the holiness of God, the holiness of Christ, is because there's nothing about Christ that we deserve. There is nothing about him that we deserve. Yes, he is my Lord. Yes, he is my Savior. I don't deserve that. Woe, woe to me. Woe to me, for I am ruined. I'm not worthy of who he is. I'm not worthy of his majesty, of his love. I'm not worthy of his mercy and grace. I'm not worthy. I mean, I look, when you think of how, who God is, that he is holy, 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 we begin to realize how unholy we are. We begin to realize how deeply stained with sin and hate that our heart is. We begin to understand the frailty of our life and that we don't even deserve life. What Isaiah is thinking right there is I should be dead. However, in verse 6, then one of the seraphim flew to, flew to me and with a burning coal in his hand which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. In all of his holiness, in all of his holiness, holy, 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 this frail, sinful man was at the throne of God, and God pardoned him. What he deserved in that moment. Even as, a, even as a prophet of the Lord, he knew this. What he deserved in that moment was death. To be struck down immediately with death. But yet God in all of his mercy spared him. And so that's the second thing that we see. We see his love. We, we, we remember the love of Christ. Galatians chapter 2, make a note, turn there, verse 20. If, you're a, if you highlight in your Bible, this should already be highlighted. The Apostle Paul says in chapter 2, verse 20 of Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. The, the Apostle Paul right here tells you, how do I live a holy life? We already saw that in 1 Peter, Peter calls us to holiness, that the Lord calls us to holiness because he is holy. He calls us to holiness, that we follow him, that we are to be holy and set apart from the rest of this world, the world that we came out of, out of that darkness, into his light. We're set apart from them. And the Apostle Paul, he puts it very clearly in Galatians 2 that I have been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live. Why? Because when it's Craig who lives, Craig is always tempted to go back. Craig is always tempted to go back to where he came from. 
Craig is always tempted to lean into his flesh. But Paul tells us we don't live through our flesh. We live through the spirit of God, that he has given us this spirit. So he's saying it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Like I, there is this power, this dunamis power talked about in Acts chapter 1 to give you the power to live as Christ lived. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. And here it is, he gave. He gave himself up for me. When you remember how holy, holy, holy he is, and you get to love, and you remember how loving he is, you have to remind yourself that this holy, holy, holy God of all creation took on the form of man took on the form of man and humbled himself to the point of death on a cross, humiliated himself in front of hundreds, thousands of people, took upon the sin of the world upon his shoulders. This holy, holy, holy God left his throne in heaven to come so that you could have salvation, so that you could live, so that you didn't have to live in the flesh and in the ways of this world, that you didn't have to walk in the ignorance that Peter was talking about in 1 Peter chapter 1, that your eyes could be open, that you could see the holiness of God, but also the love of God, that he loves you so much that he gave himself for you. When you think about how how minuscule in the, in the grand scheme of things that we are. I mean, the only thing I can think of, this, this past week I, I had to go back and I still have a property in East Texas and I was trying to get it sort of straightened out and I was trying to get some things back here to Allen that I needed here. And I was going through my, this little apartment that's on my shop and I was looking through things and there's one of these little water bugs, if y'all know it, I hate those little things. Little water bug running across. I never thought one second about stepping, I mean, I just stepped on that thing, smushed it, I didn't even sweep it up till later, right? I mean, that thing meant nothing to me. I would never have given up my life to save that water bug. But in the grand scheme of things, when you begin to understand the wickedness of our heart, the frailty of our flesh, when you begin to realize really who we are as humans and who God is as holy, 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 you realize how great his love is because what we deserve is for him to just step on us and keep moving. But instead of stepping on us and keeping on moving, he looks and he sees something special. He sees something he loves. He sees something he wants a relationship with, and that is humanity. He desires a relationship, a personal relationship with every human. He desires this relationship. He wants to see every single person come to the knowledge of salvation and come to know him. And he knew they could not do it on their own. He knew that in our frailty, he knew that in our weakness, he knew in our makeup that we could not do it. So he, in all of his holiness, left his throne, came in the form of man, took upon flesh, and the weaknesses of that flesh died on the cross, but he lived a sinless life, showing us it's, it is possible. I am God. And on the third day, he rose again, and we're reminded of his love because of his sacrifice. His sacrifice. In Ephesians, Paul writes, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you. And what did he do? He gave himself up for us and offering a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. And in Acts, we get this picture as Peter's preaching in Acts chapter 3. And he's talking to the religious leaders of that day that they're the ones that said crucify him. They're the ones that wanted him on trial. They wanted Christ to die. And in Acts chapter 3, verse 14, Peter talking to them says, But you, talking to those religious leaders, disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. 
We read that a few weeks ago where the crowd called out for the murderer Barabbas. Give us Barabbas, not Christ. Crucify Christ. Give us Barabbas. And they asked for a murderer to be granted to them and put to death the prince of life, Peter said, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. And what he's telling them is you did this. You crucified him because you didn't believe that he truly was God. You did not believe he was the Holy One. Now he has risen from the dead. Now he's alive. And you better see it because the truth of the matter is Christ died for them. The ones that murdered him. He died for them. He let them do that to him because of his love. So we're reminded of this his holiness, we're mind, reminded of his love, and we're reminded of his mercy. Titus 3, 4 says this. If you have it, write it down in your notes. Circle it. You should have this one circled as well. But when the kindness, the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. Let's stop there. Christ saved. He's talking to the church. He's talking to Titus, the elder, the pastor. He's reminding him of who Christ is. He's reminding him of who he is in Christ. And he reminds him that you were saved. He saved us, he said in verse 5, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. If you're here today and you're not saved, if you're here today, you're not born again, you, you don't have a relationship with Jesus and you know you don't, but you sit here and you hear about this holy, holy, holy God, this supreme, all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful being that created you and wants a relationship with you, and you begin to realize your frailty, your sinfulness, your wicked heart. And you begin to think, how could I ever have a relationship with such a holy, holy, holy God? Because he made a way. He made a way through his son Jesus. Not on the deeds that you do. See, there's not enough righteous deeds. There's not enough good things that you can do to save yourself. Because you cannot even be close to holy apart from Jesus. The only way the only way you can be holy, the only way you can find salvation is through the blood of Christ. And it is not by what you do, it's by what he did. It is not by your deeds of righteousness, it says here, but it's based upon his mercy. That according to his mercy and by the washing of the regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. By his mercy, the Holy Spirit is poured out inside of you. I have people ask me all the time, Pastor, how do I really know? How do I really know that I'm saved? You, you don't know because you said a prayer. You don't know because you were baptized in a church. You don't know because somebody voted you in to serve at a church. You don't know because, you know because of any of those things that you do or have done. You know because God Almighty poured out his mercy and saved you. By faith you received him because that's the only thing that you can do is just receive the grace that he offers. And when that happens, he pours out his spirit inside of you. That's what changes you and gives you the power to be holy, to be set apart, to follow him. The regeneration takes place. Your heart goes, as Ezekiel says, it goes from being a heart of stone that is hard and wants to reject God to being a heart of flesh that is soft. And it receives the spirit of God. And it receives 
the messages saying that, that are convicting you of your sin. And it receives, you know, how you should repent and turn from your sin. It receives the fact that you know you should worship and honor this holy, holy, holy God and follow him to the ends of the earth. Your heart receives that because God changes it when by faith you believe. And then God does the work. And we see that. And we see that it's mercy. It is according to his mercy. And it always has been. You know, the, the Old Testament saints are saved the same way you were. It just looked a little bit different. But it was always according to God's mercy, his compassion, and his grace. In Psalm 103, we're reminded in verse 7, he made known his way to Moses, acts to the son of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness. That's who he is. He is holy, holy, holy. And he loves you with a love that you can't even fathom. And he is merciful and only by his mercy, his mercy being poured out into your life, can you truly be saved. And so as we approach the table, the communion table, we begin to ask ourselves, as we remember these things, we begin to ask ourselves some questions. The first question that any and every person should be asking themselves right now is, Am I truly a follower of Jesus? Do I know the Lord? Does he know me? Do, are we really in a relationship? The evidence of that is the Holy Spirit inside of you. Does the Holy Spirit guide you? Does the Holy Spirit convict you? Do you see the changes of the Holy Spirit, the evidence in your life? And you say, well, what does that look like? The Bible tells us that it looks like this. Love, you start to love differently. Love, joy, peace. Your, your whole life begins to change. The outlook and the way you see things begins to look different. Your, your peace and your joy that you have, it, it, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's almost unexplainable. Even though you may be surrounded by death and tragedy, all of a sudden you have this peace that can't be understood. That's not you. It's Jesus. When you've truly surrendered and given your life to him, he changes you from the inside. And these things start to appear, and they look different than the, than the way the world makes them appear. Because it's a supernatural spiritual act that can only happen by the mighty hand of God. And so all of a sudden, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, all of these things begin to develop in you, and you're like, where is this coming from? And it's coming from the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, as they begin to do that work in your life, and the Spirit works in your life, people around you are going, man, what happened to him? What, what happened to her? What's going on? It's like they're a different person. They're different than they used to be. It's like they've been set apart from where they used to stand. It's like they're set apart and they're, they're living a different life because they've been called out of darkness into the marvelous light of Jesus. Jesus has changed their heart and their life. If that has happened to you, praise God. But if it has not, today, the Bible says, is the day of salvation. Today, you can be saved. You can receive the salvation that God desperately wants you to have because he wants a relationship with you. He does not want to be this giant supreme being that is a distance from you, just watching things fall apart in the world. But he wants to be your Lord, your Savior, your Father. He wants to walk with you every day of your life through the good and the bad. And that is available to you when you realize that your sin offends a holy God. Your life offends a holy God. And without him, there is no life, no true life. 
And if you really want life, an eternal life with the Lord, then you let go of everything in this world and you truly believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and rose again, that he is the one and only Holy One, Son of God, and you receive him as that, and you say, I cannot be saved any other way than by Jesus. There's nothing I can do, and I need him, and I want him today. And if that is you, right now where you sit, you can receive that grace you, you can cry out to him right now, God, I need you, and I want you. And that's my encouragement to you. Before we ever even get to this table, that you do that. And if you do it, I, I encourage you to come tell me. I'm going to be down here. I'm going to be praying with people. You come tell me. But for us, the believers, you say, I know. I, I know I have the Holy Spirit in my heart. I know that he lives in me. And I know I'm set apart. And I may not walk with him always. And I may let my flesh get the best of me sometimes. But I know he is mine and I am his. Well, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the apostle Paul writes to them, to us, to the church, preparing us, saying this. For I received from the Lord, in verse 23, I received from the Lord that which I deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance in me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks this cup, now pay attention, of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself. Here is what we're called to do. Before we ever take the bread, before we ever drink the cup, a man, it says, is to examine himself. You begin to look at your heart. You begin to look at your motives. You begin to look at your life. You begin to look at your walk with Christ. You examine yourself, and in doing so, he is to eat the bread and drink the cup. You examine yourself first, and then it says, for he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. Like if you don't, if you come to this table and you come nonchalantly before a holy, holy, holy God, and you're not coming in the right heart and in the right manner, the scripture says that is very dangerous because you will be judged for that. And in verse 30 it says, For this reason many among you are weak and sick. He's telling the church in Corinth that there's some of you that are really struggling right now and you're weak and you're sick. And you know why? It's because you didn't do this right. I don't know if anybody's ever told you that. That seems like a very important part of this to me. That if we're not right with God, before we take this, I may go home tonight and get the stomach virus, and I hate that worse than anything in the world. I really do. Not only that, but it says in verse 31, but we judge ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. So if we're good, and we look at our heart, and there's nothing that should be confessed there, then we're good. We go to the table. God wants to commune with us. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not condemn, be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. He says, listen, you better make sure in that one verse, he says, the weak, the sick, and even the ones asleep. I look around, there are not many of you sleeping in here right now. And that's not the kind of sleep he was talking about. He's talking about the ones that were dead did this wrong. They didn't judge themselves rightly. They didn't examine their heart. Because here is the truth. Yes, I am a sinner saved by grace that falls short of the glory of God. But he has called me to be holy. And I'm doing my best to walk in him and with him. But I mess up. And I do it daily. And there's things I have to get right with him. 
because there's things that you know my mind thinks of, there's things my eyes see, there's things my ears hear, there's things my hands do. There's attitudes that I have. There's things that I say to people, and they're not right, and I know they're not right, and I know God does not want me doing those things, and I know they dishonor him, and yet I allow them to come out of my mouth. I allow, them to, I allow my hands to do the things they shouldn't. And so in the midst of all of that, I have a responsibility here, and that is to get right and judge myself rightly. And Proverbs 28, 13 says this, he who conceals his transgressions, that is those sins I'm talking about, he who conceals them, he who hides them, he who conceals their transgressions will not prosper. When I go over there and look at verse 30 in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that's not prospering. The sick, the weak, the dead, not prospering. He says, those who conceal their transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them finds compassion. Find compassion today. 1 John 1, 9 tells us this, right? 1 John 1, 9 tells us this, that if, if we will confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive them. He is faithful and just to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. He is faithful and just. And so in just a moment, we're going to have an altar call. That is your time to judge yourself. If you're here and you say, I don't know Christ and I want to, or maybe you've received him already while you sit here in your chair, just come tell me, say, Pastor, today is it. I truly surrender and give my life to Jesus. If you're here and you're judging yourself and you say, my heart's not right. Listen, I don't have to be your advocate. I don't have to be your high priest and your go-between. That's Jesus. But you go to him. You go before your holy, holy, holy God. You kneel before him and you say, God, forgive me for my attitude. Forgive me for my thoughts. Forgive me for being mean to my wife. Forgive me for not disciplining my kids. Forgive me for doing these things. Forgive me for my wrong attitude. God, you see me and you see every bit of me. Forgive me for being me when I should be being Jesus because you've called me to be holy. Confess and get right and experience true communion today with the Spirit of God. Heavenly Father, God, we come to you right now. None of us deserving to come to your table. None of us deserve to be here today. But God, by your mercy we are. By your grace, we can come to this table today. Lord, I pray right now and I ask you, Lord, to reveal to every single person in this room the depth of our sin, that we stand before a holy, holy, holy God, and our sins can be forgiven if we will trust Jesus. Lord, I pray that those in this room that have never trusted him as their Lord and Savior today, let their heart be changed, let the Spirit fall upon them, let them receive forgiveness today and know you and walk with you. And Lord, let us that are in this room that have the right to be called your children, that our hearts have been changed, that we do know you, but yet we've allowed sin to creep in. We've allowed things to, to, to come in and, and tarnish the image that you have put inside our heart. Lord, let us open up our hearts and examine them today and make them right with you. Lord, you have promised that if we will confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Let us be bold enough to bring them to you today, realizing, as it says in Proverbs 28, that we will receive compassion, not judgment. Compassion. Let us come before you receiving compassion today and experience your table in a new way. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Lord, as I want to ask you to stand, and as we sing this last song, if you need to come, the altar is open. You can kneel there at your chair. You can stand there and pray. But my advice is judge yourself rightly as we sing. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength. My song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, 
firm from the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. 